One of the most popular techniques for model selection is cross-validation. And maybe one of the reasons why it's so popular is because it's very simple, very easy to understand, and it's also fairly general in terms of the number of situations that you can apply it. So the setup for cross-validation, it's the supervised learning setup. We've got some data, some x's and y's, x1, y1, up to xn, yn. And we, we are going to assume that we have some class of models. So m will be the, the value for a particular you know, set, of, set, set of parameters for describing a particular model. And we assume that m takes some, it's from some finite class of models. So let's say, let's just number the models 1 to c. So we can always just number them. They're from, from some finite set. So for example, m could be, if you were doing regression with, with basis functions, linear regression, m could be the number of basis functions that you're going to use for your model. Or it could be like in a k nearest neighbor classifier. It could be k for how many neighbors you're going to look at. And also though, it, it, you know, so here we are assuming it's from a finite set, but what if, what if you wanted to have, you know, what if your, your class of models had a continuous valued parameter? that was controlling the model complexity. Well, one thing, I mean, one thing you could do would just be to like discretize, discretize the space. But that'll only really work for smaller, you know, lower dimension, like if you had one parameter. And so in higher dimensions for continuous value parameters, cross-validation is not, not really going to work very well because you would have to have too many, you know, too many discretizations of a, you know, too many discretized points in some high dimensional space. So we want to choose one of these models that's going to do well, you know, for, for this problem. And if we're thinking from a decision theoretic point of view, which we, which we are, then we want to minimize our expected loss. So we, we assume some loss function, L, and we want to mi minimize the expected loss w for a new y and x. So we have some prediction function f, and let's subscript f by m to denote the f that we would get from the mth model on the data set, on the data set d. So f also depends on d here, but I'm not going to make that, not making that sort of explicit. And we want to choose m to minimize this, to minimize this quantity. And we're assuming, so let's call it first, let's call this epsilon sub m, epsilon for error. Think of this as sort of an, a measure of error. And we're assuming here that x and y are distributed, are random variables, distributed according to some probability distribution p, some true probability distribution that is unknown to us. Unknown. So this is the true probability distribution. And we want to minimize our expected loss under this true distribution. So this is not the p that we're using for our model. You know, we're going. To, we might have some. We might have some probabilistic model that we're using to model this data. But this p is the true. So this is the true distribution. Because that's what we really want to minimize our expected loss for, right? For the true thing. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's let's do a little thought experiment first. First, let's say let's say we had our data here. Let's rewrite it again. X1, Y1 up to X and Y N. And let's suppose that we also had somehow magically we had some test set let's call it x prime 1 y prime 1 up to x prime t y prime t some test set and suppose that these were you know our data were drawn iid from some from this distribution p and that also the test set was drawn iid this was a sample that was drawn iid from this distribution, from this true distribution p. 
well then you know we could we could do the natural thing we could train our model you know we could for each of these models m we could train our model on the data set d and then test it on the test set and see which one had the smallest the smallest error which one had the smallest epsilon m and then we we could choose the one with the smallest error and we would happily go on our way and that would be our that would be our model m but we don't but this is just an imaginary thing we don't have such a test set but of course well we have you know this is this is essentially the same as as part as this right so why not just split up so let's split so let's take our data set so let's draw let's draw let's take our data set here and let me draw let me draw this as just a sort of block so I don't have to have, have to keep drawing writing x1 y1 so let's just visualize this as a block you know like this would be the first point x1 y1 x2 y2 x3 y3 and so on and then our training the training set over here that thing is going to be let's make that red that's this other thing over here but we can we can see d that's what we get and let's let's mimic the test set thing let's draw let's let's split this say maybe here into a validation set we call this the validation set and a over here all the rest a training set and then we could train you know for each of the m model for each of the models m we could train it on the training set and then evaluate its performance on the validation set and then do the same thing. Choose the one with the smallest empirical error on the validation set. And that is called, so let me make a little space here, that is called validation. So let me say A, option A, validation, or sometimes people call this true validation. That's a little bit misleading, but that's sometimes what it's called. So all of this stuff is our what we can see, and all of this we can't see. This is just imaginary, and this is, of course, this is called the test set over here. So we have training, validation, and test. So if that's validation, what is cross-validation? Well, it might occur to you that there's something a little bit, you know, I mean, this is all this is all fine and well. We can do this, and this will give us give us some measure of the performance of our of our each of these m model or each of these models m I should say there's c of them each of these models m but if you you know you might think well hey you know what if just by chance one of the models tended to do really well on this validation set but it wasn't really a good model in general you know we could just get sort of unlucky and and this particular split might not be representative and so why not do a bunch of splits? And that is the idea behind cross-validation. Cross-validation. So what is cross-validation? Well, let's take this so we have our, our data set D here. Let's redraw this down here. This is our whole data set, 1 to n. And the first step in cross-validation, let's keep that in green, I guess. So step 1 is permute the data. Randomly permute. Well, not randomly. So you randomly permute the data. Randomly permute. I will put random. So we get another... redraw the data set down here and it's going to be permuted so each of these points goes to a, a new location and so on so you shuffle the data randomly that's step one and step two we're going to split the data 
into k folds. So we need to choose some there. This cross validation has a parameter k. So this is going to be k fold cross validation. And let's say, for purposes of illustration here, let's say that k is 5. So we get this permuted thing. This is just the same thing here. And we split it into five equally sized parts. So if n was 100, if n was 100, then these would each have 20 points. And this is called fold 1. This one is fold 2, fold 3, fold 4, and fold 5. So the first, so the each fold is a subset of 20 points in this, you know, in this little example where n is, if n is 100 and k is 5, then each fold has 20 points. But in general, it's their equally sized, or you know, you try to get them as close to equal as possible. Equally sized subsets that divide the whole data set D into k different parts. So we've split it into these k different folds, and now comes the validation. So three we're going to do a series of rounds. So let me draw a matrix here. So we have this matrix. And each row in the matrix is going to be a copy. Well, notionally, it's not, I mean, just sort of for visualization purposes, is a copy of this, this, these 100 points. And we split it, so we have I guess I can go ahead and draw draw the the different folds. So in each row we have a copy, and this is always so the fold, so this is fold one, fold two, fold three, fold four, and fold five. So this is fold one here, first row. This is fold one also, it's the same points. This is fold one. This is fold one, this is fold one. I just have five, I've made five copies of the data. And now we have rounds. This will, this will be for round one, round two, round three, round four, and round five. The number of rounds is always equal to the number of folds. And now, so remember before, we for validation, we had our training set and our validation set. And now our validation set, let's make a little more room. On each of these rounds, we'll choose there will be a different fold for the validation set. So in the first round, this one will be validation. The second round, so in the first round, fold one is the validation set. In the second round, fold two is the validation set. In the third round, fold three is the validation set, and then four for four and five for five. Validation set. And for fold one, all of the rest, everything else is the test. So all of this, fold three, four, and five is all, this is all the training set. For, for round one. So we, we take fold two, three, four, and five, we lump them all up together into one, one big set, and then we train on that, and then we're going to validate on this. Okay. All right, so I'm out of time in this video. I will finish sort of filling, you know, sketching this in, and then we'll, we'll pick it up in another video. Okay. Okay. See you soon.